So let's jump into um, Tales from the Hood now, right? Um, obviously, it got like a Twilight Zone. Obviously, Twilight Zone influenced, gave you an influence there. All right. Um, for this this for this for movie now, from what I understand, you got a $6 million budget, right? What role does Spike Lee play in you getting the funding for the movie, if he played any role at all? He played everything. Um, I wouldn't have, that that movie got made because of Spike. Um, so let's see. I, I so I did Fear of a Black Hat. We got that off the ground. It, it you know it did what it did. Uh, it didn't come out before CB4. It should have come out. It could have come out before CB4. But ITC, the company that uh, we made the movie for, thought that CB4 would create a bigger interest for their film because CB4 was a universal movie. It had, you know, a bigger star and had more money behind it. Um, no shade on CB4, but all I will say is money doesn't necessarily equal funny, okay? Um, it's what you put on the screen. Um, so we came out afterwards, which turned out not to be a good thing because CB4 didn't really bust things open like that. But we got a lot of people that watched it. One of those was Spike, who, who saw it. I didn't even know he saw it, but he, you know, Spike is up on everything. He saw it. So um, I was at a, his premiere out here for Girl 6. That was the one, the telephone one. Um, and uh, I was at the, after the premiere, well, here's another fun Hollywood story. This is how Hollywood works. Um, so after the premiere, I was in the lobby. I think it was at the, might have been at the Directors Guild or some Writers Guild, one of those places. And I was in the lobby, and there was a couple of uh, ladies, and I was trying to talk to one of them, and they just shut me down. I mean, it was like they had no time. I mean, it was, it was brutal, you know? And <laughs> so I'm like, hey, and so I turned like this. When I turned like this, Spike came out of the screen and he's like, yo, Rusty, I like Fear of a Black Hat. What you getting ready to do next? I'm like, I'm working on this horror film called um, Tales from the Hood. Send it to me, I'm gonna do it. And he walked away. And I was like, damn. And then these two girls bounced back in front of me. I was like, what the? <laughs> They're like, hi, hi. I'm like, oh, I see how Hollywood works. <laughs> it was ridiculous. Right, so, uh, <laughs> that's crazy. All right. So um, you, you're doing Tales from the Hood, right? Uh, you touch on some serious topics because Tales of the Hood is obviously it's a classic movie and it's unique in the fact that it's a horror movie, right? But it touches on these social issues. And it's not like err in your face, you know, it's intertwined in the story. So you have the... Uh, police brutality, you have the racism, you have the corrupt politicians, right? The one I wanted to talk about, what you were telling the story earlier, was about the domestic abuse and the child abuse. Ah, yeah. Um, and, and from what I understand, you're, you had a personal experience or you, you witnessed something that influenced that story. And that story in the, the, the movie was called what? Uh, boys Do Get uh, Bruised? Yeah, Boys Don't. Boys don't cry or something like Boys that. Boys don't cry. All right, yeah, all right. I can't, I, I'm um, kind of blanking on what, what the name is now, but yeah, that was the one with David Allen Greer and, and Paula J. Parker. Um, yeah. So okay. So uh, this neighborhood that I moved into after we left the black neighborhood, this this uh, blue collar white neighborhood where I, where I made some friends. So one day, I went over to this kid's house. And we're just gonna play. We're gonna play in the basement. You know of this. Back east, you, you got the, the basements and the, with the dirt floors, a lot of times yeah. it's just old, you know, old school basements. And uh, we would go down there and play and, you know, just throw balls or whatever the hell we were doing down there. Um, so I go to his house and, you know, you would usually you would go through the kitchen. There'd be a door in the kitchen and the stairs would go down to the, to the cellar. And he opens up the door and his little sister who was maybe, I don't know, five or six. She was hogtied and gagged with facing the wall. She was on her knees, with her hands tied behind her back, her feet tied, and a gag in her mouth. 
And I was like, man, this is that. That's exactly what I, you know, I didn't frame it that way because I was probably nine or 10 at the time, maybe 10, 10, 10, 11, somewhere in there. Um, but it was, it was, I was like, what? You know, I'm like, dude, what, <laughs> what's this? And he's like, oh, she, you know, she did something bad or, you know, I don't, you know, she's being punished. And then he's like, okay, let's go downstairs. So we went downstairs and we're playing and I leave and she's still there. And it just messed with me, man. It was like, I knew it was wrong and I knew it was jacked up, um, you know, and there were a lot, there, there were a couple of dysfunctional families in the neighborhood, white, white dysfunctional families. And I say that not to, to point fingers at white folks. I just want people to know that they weren't black because <laughs> we got enough issues. And I say it, people will assume that because I'm black, they're black. No, they, this was a white family. And um, this little girl who was, you know, he, the, the kid, and then he had an older sister. Um, but she seemed to, I noticed when I would go over to this house, she would be the one that caught all the hell. And that's not unusual sometime in, in families where there's some kind of abuse. They, they pick one kid that is always the, the scapegoat for stuff that, they, you know, they couldn't possibly have been the problem. You know, you know what I'm saying? It's, it's like, she five or six, what are you doing? Um, so anyhow, I saw this and I remember going home to my, uh, my house and my dad comes home from work. And at the time, he, had, he, he was still on the, uh, he still worked for the Pittsburgh uh, Police Force as a detective in the juvenile division. Uh, I mean, he carried a gun, he had a badge, he was a detective, he was a detective. And um, so I told him, I was like, Dad, uh, I went to so-and-so's house and they had gagged and tied the girl, I won't even say her name, uh, it wasn't Tracy, but so I'll say Tracy. Gag and tied Tracy on the floor. Uh, you should do something. <laughs> and my father said to me, I can't mess with those white people. And that was, that was such a moment of understanding. You got a gun, you got a badge, you're on the force and you are afraid to go down and deal with, you know, it, it wasn't like, well, legally, you know, I'd have to see it. Or, it wasn't any of that. It was just they're white people. I can't mess with them. They're off limits for me and my badge. Um, and, it, and it was like one of those moments, like, you know, you, when you're a kid, you, you, you grow up with your parents and you're like, well, they're, they're very powerful, they're this and that. And there's always a certain point where you realize they're not infallible, they're human, and they, they make mistakes. Uh, but this was learning, not just that, but where you were in the socioeconomic system and how a black man who was given a certain amount of power still could not, could not use it or at least feel comfortable trying to use it against a guy. And I mean, like, it wasn't like this family was connected to anything. They were just poor white people. Um, the, 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 the father of the kids wasn't there. They lived with the grandparents. It was a mess. They were a dysfunctional uh, family, a very dysfunctional family. But he couldn't do anything with it. And that, that really informed a lot of how I started to look at the world. And then when you look at that particular, uh, that particular part of Tales from the Hood, now, that, that's not a, not a white family in there, but I had it's also relatable. seen, yeah, I had also <laughs> seen this you know? in, 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 our, in our world, you know, the, the, the kind of over, the kind of hyper-masculinity that causes men to feel like they have to dominate, you know, either the kids, their woman, uh, that 
is is you know it's 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 just uh it's a bad it, it, thing. It, it touched on a lot of things, and it's probably, I'm not sure if you did this uh, purposely or just happened. I think it hit even more that David Allen Greer did it because people know him as a comedian. Oh, yeah. So I think I think the part hits even more, and it's just the whole absentee father, high probability of abuse. You know, the boyfriend comes in, the woman wants, you know, that type of protection or that nurture or love, and they kind of let things go that shouldn't be going. The child's interpret interpretation of this dynamic like you kind of covered everything in that scene you know yeah and, and it's you know it's something that you you know that that ha obviously happens in our our community and uh it, it's interesting that when we screen tested the film and the original cut of that uh there's a beating that david allen greer when he when he's beating paula j parker um was even longer and the, the ratings board kind of made, said, we're going to give you an X if you <laughs> beat her. I was like, I, I, I didn't have the power to fight it. I wish I, I did. Because what happened when we screened that the first time, because uh, there was a lot of young, young kids in the audience. And when he first starts beating Paula, takes the belt off and he starts beating her, they would laugh. They started laughing, you know, and... What happened was, as that beating went on, the laughter got quieter and quieter till you could tell that they were on the verge of tears. And it was, it, it was another thing that was like really instructive to me about us black folk, how, we, how we're seen and how we see things. So, and the reason I say that is because, and you may remember this, when Schindler's List came out, there was a, a screening, I think it happened in Oakland, where um, the black kids that were screening Schindler's List, they were laughing, they were goofing at some of the stuff in the movie. And, oh my God, you know, it was like people, you know, they, they were ready to go up there and march on these black kids. But what they didn't realize is, and what I realized is I watched how this played out was this is a defense mechanism. These kids, they, they see abuse. That hits home, bro, so they got to put on that they, fake laugh. They got to put on the fake face. And even if they're seeing it from a Jewish community, it's still the same thing. It's like, it still I, hurts. It still hurts. I can't let my boys, this girl I'm trying to hook up with, see me feel this see me be affected by this in a way that makes me look weak. And, um, uh, but once again, that, that plays into, you know, what I was saying, this, this, this need, especially for black males, to feel like they're not allowed to show emotion. They're not allowed to be vulnerable. And what happens is they take it out on things. They'll either take it out on the people that they should that they should love. Sometimes they take it out on themselves uh, through you know any number of bad habits, uh, or they they may take it out on their community, um, and that's that's something that you know uh, I think is is really something that we need to to to, to fight against to, or or figure out. But it's a it's a a systemic problem uh, for us, I think, in, in how, we're, how we're raised, how we're viewed, how society kind of looks at us, and our need to be able to, um, our need to be able to rise above circumstance. And sometimes you have to be strong to rise above circumstance. Sometimes you got to be so strong, you don't know how to be vulnerable. No. Yeah. Uh. And uh, there's, a, there's one more thing I want to touch on that scene, your use of uh, stop animation instead of the DGI. Um, it kind of <laughs> it brings that creepiness in it. And it's I, also like it just looks more, you know, like just more, more disturbing, I think. Yeah, I mean, and, and Tails, the doll, um, and of course, you know, at the time that we did this, we, it was the only option that we had was to, to use stop animation. There's, there's a little bit of... Uh, 
I guess what you would nowadays call digital work, but just when Clarence Williams turns into the devil and his tongue comes out, it's the worst looking effect in the movie because it looks so cartoon like. And, you know, uh, digital work has become, you know, come a long way. That said, I'm really glad that we didn't have the opportunity to, to make the dolls move through a digital process because there's something about seeing, you know, that the, the, the Kyoto brothers who were the puppeteers on this thing and built all these dolls had to shoot the doll, move it, move it, move it, take shot, 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 and put that together to make it look seamless. But there's something about that jerkiness that, that makes it look just scarier. Um, if it's moving too smooth, it's just like, eh, yeah, right right. whatever. All right. And uh, I want to ask, like, when you're working with an actor like uh, Clarence Williams III, right, um, do you, do you like direct him or do you guide him? Like, how does it work when you work with that caliber of actor? Um, if you have a really good actor, uh, you, you discuss the, you're discussing the scene. Um, as a director, you need to know where you want it to go, but you have to be open to, to where they're, they're coming from. Um, and, and you, and it's and like, I think what you're saying is right. It's kind of like you're guiding you're guiding or you're giving a roadmap to where you're hoping uh, things will go. Um, I'll give an example. I did a movie called 57 Seconds. We had uh, Morgan, Morgan Freeman. Freeman. Yeah. And there was a scene where uh, Josh Hutcherson comes to Morgan Freeman's offices. Uh, and Morgan Freeman is like, a, he's like a, a Steve Jobs type character in this. He, he is the figurehead for this huge, uh, huge uh, computer and, and tech company. Um, and Morgan's character in the movie uh, sees Josh in the lobby. He comes to kind of get Josh in the lobby. And Morgan's like, when we were on the set, he's like, I don't know why I'm coming to get this guy in the lobby. This is my company. It's like a billion dollar company. I wouldn't come and get this fool in the lobby. And I said, no. I said, so I said, so you're, you're not, that's not what you're doing. I said, and you're kind of coming more like God. Now, Morgan's played God, so Morgan's like, I don't want to be God. <laughs> That's how he said it. I don't want to be God. <laughs> I'm like, okay, Mr. Freeman, <laughs> you're not, that, uh, let me explain. So I said, Josh is going to be down here. Um, you are going to be, two, there, it was, this lobby was like two or three stories high. And I said, it's like you've come out of your office. You're up there on this balcony, which I showed him. And I said, you're looking down on him. So I said, it's a power play. And he's like, ah, OK, got it. <laughs> so you, you, know, you, have to, you have to know what you want and have to be able to explain it. Um, and, and good actors will, you know, will work with that. Um, the actor. The, not just actors, directors, anybody, the, where you have problems with anyone creatively is if they are um, uncertain or fearful or, or they, they, they're not trusting in themselves. That, that's where difficulties generally that Come. sounds <clears throat> that sounds like a universal thing with that insecurity. The people I've I've met that are truly a master of their craft. Yeah. They're very humble and easy to work with. But those who I guess have to put on this facade because they're not sure about their capabilities. Yeah. Tend to be a little rough to work with, you know. That yeah. that is very, very true. And usually when you see somebody acting out, it's because they've got some insecure issues. Yeah, they're not they're not too sure. Uh one one last thing I want to talk about. Uh, Tales from the Hood, right? Oh, well, two questions. Where did you find DeAndre Bonds? Because I think that was his first film. Robbie Reed was our casting director, and she brought DeAndre to the table, and uh, he was amazing. Yeah, I, 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 I mean, he came in, he read, and it was like, and the story that she told me, or maybe DeAndre told me, is like he met her, I don't know where he met Robbie. But he was like, what do you do? <laughs> Wherever they met, he was like, what do you do? She's like, 
oh, I cast actors for movies. Um, I'm, you know, paraphrasing. And he's like, I can do that. That's just easy. And she's like, oh, really? And he was right. <laughs> he's, That's crazy. He's just yeah, a natural. Like,